my name is David Armstrong. I'm a consultant rheumatologist in the Western Trust. I was a consultant over in the north of England for a few years, and I previously worked in Manchester and worked in Belfast. I've been involved in research in autoimmune diseases, and I've also been involved in research in fibromyalgia when I worked in Belfast. Over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I suppose I've seen hundreds, maybe even over a thousand patients with fibromyalgia, both in Northern Ireland and, and when I worked in England. It's uh, a common condition and uh, it's increasingly diagnosed and I think people are increasingly being sent to hospital as well uh, with, with the condition. Um, I tend to think of it in three big sections. One is people complain a lot of, of tiredness and sleep problems. Secondly, people complain of muscle pain, muscle aching, muscle burning. And thirdly, there's, uh, there's a range of other symptoms which are probably related to those two. For some people, it's problems with their memory. For some people, it's feeling depressed, bursting into tears at times. For other people, it's tingling in the hands and the feet. It's irritable bile symptoms. Uh, I think those uh, third group of, of symptoms depend more on the patient's personality and circumstances. But the two big groups are sleep problems and tiredness and muscle burning and, and muscle aching. Research tends to suggest in fibromyalgia that problems with sleep are actually uh, near the core of, of what's causing the, the condition. There are different levels of human sleep um, and patients who never get below level one or two sleep, their sleep is restless, they wake feeling unrefreshed in the morning. And that seems to be the sleep pattern that people with fibromyalgia have. Uh, by contrast, level four or five sleep is when you uh, feel unconscious, you wake up feeling wonderful and refreshed and ready for another day. And fibromyalgia sufferers will very seldom uh, report that that's the, the pattern of sleep that they have. Um, the brain needs sleep to uh, feel refreshed, to um, regenerate levels of various uh, chemicals. Um, and it seems to be that because fibromyalgia sufferers never get fully refreshed uh, that they feel so rotten, so lousy during the day. That manifests itself as burning, aching in the muscles, the feeling that uh, you're always suffering from the flu, difficulty carrying out just day-to-day -day tasks. Um, and that, that can, be, can vary from day-to-day -day as well um, and certainly uh, other stresses or other illnesses intervene, then it can make things a lot worse for people. As regards what triggers it off in the first place, uh, again that's different in different people. Some people it's a major life event. Uh, I saw a, a lady only a few days ago who told me she'd been invo involved in, in a major traffic accident and she hadn't suffered any uh, serious physical injury but afterwards she had difficulty sleeping and she felt sore all over and within a few weeks this really developed into a fairly typical case of fibromyalgia. For other people they have what we call chronic illnesses such as asthma, diabetes, sometimes back pain caused by an injury and that also disturbs the, the sleep pattern um, and leaves the brain in a state where it never really wants to, wants to relax entirely, never really wants to, to, to get into the deep level of sleep and patients therefore feel chronically tired and chronically unrefreshed. As regards treatment in general for fibromyalgia, I try to be positive about it. Um, some people are sent away from the doctor being told there's really nothing much can be done. Um, and that's, that's certainly not true. Um, there are a number of different things you can do. Um, and again, I would probably divide this into three areas. As regards supplements, yes, I think it's important to make sure that you have a, a firm foundation on which to fight fibromyalgia. I was involved in research some years ago which suggested that many fibromyalgia patients have levels of vitamin D which are below those which would be considered ideal. So I often check vitamin D levels and I would often recommend people would take a vitamin D supplement if they have fibromyalgia. There are other supplements like vitamin C, like zinc which is good for the immune system, uh, cod liver oil, flaxseed oil, all of which have been shown to be useful for the immune system and I think useful for people whose system is generally quite run down. Um, those are probably the main things I would recommend in terms of supplements. Having laid a firm foundation then, uh, the two other main areas of, of treatment are 
are painkilling medication with which you need to be careful um, and also then exercise based therapy. Now again exercise based therapy uh, can be misused. The suggestion that fibromyalgia sufferers should go out and join the gym or, or start jogging is just it, it's nonsense because if you were able to do that then you probably don't have fibromyalgia. However, there is good research evidence to suggest that very gentle exercise and that gradually increasing the amount of exercise you do not only helps stretch out muscles and helps muscle pain, but also improves quality of sleep, and which as I said earlier, I think it is somewhere near the core of what actually causes this, this condition. What sufferers need to do is find something that they can do comfortably. That might be going to aqua aerobics, that might simply be walking five or ten minutes a day, it might be getting an exercise bike and putting it in the front room and using that even for five minutes a day and going and having a hot bath then the next day using it for ten minutes and going and having a hot bath and make it an enjoyable experience put on some music watch television do something that you can at least feel that you're getting your exercise and that you're doing something to fight fibromyalgia I think some of the problem with the condition is that people feel they've been floored by it and they're not necessarily getting a lot of support uh, or help from, from the medical profession or from others. This is something that you do need to, to feel you have a chance to fight against. So find some sort of exercise that you like doing, make sure it's enjoyable um, and there's good evidence that that will stretch out muscles, that it will improve the quality of your sleep and that most people with this do improve over time, that would be my experience. As regards medication from the doctor, it's a mistake to use heavier and heavier painkillers. I've seen patients who've even been on, on morphine tablets for fibromyalgia. That tends not to help, and I think it's rather over-medicating. There are things that can help. There are tablets that can help relax muscles, that can improve quality of sleep, and even quite simple painkillers like paracetamol and cocodamol can be useful as well. Um, as regards alternative treatments, I try to keep a fairly open mind about it. Um, certainly physical therapies such as massage are very useful. Um, acupuncture many people find useful. One of the areas that people get a lot of muscular tension and pain is around the neck and upper back. Uh, and certainly massage and acupuncture can be useful for that. Some people find yoga, uh, tai chi and that sort of activity useful as well. As regards some of the more uh, unusual dietary modifications and so on, I would tend to be more skeptical about those. I, I, I try to stay open-minded in that I say to people, you try anything that makes you feel better, unless it's something that I feel can actually be a risk to their health. So for example, Occasionally people come to me and say I've completely excluded dairy produce from my diet because I've been told it might make me feel better. Well, completely excluding dairy produce from your diet isn't good for your health because many patients with fibromyalgia will be at risk of developing osteoporosis later in life, brittle bone disease. And so excluding calcium and, and milk and butter and cheese from your diet isn't good for that. Um, another one you often hear is people are told to exclude pork and bacon from their diet. The logical conclusion from that would be who people who don't eat pork and bacon for religious reasons, for example Jewish people or Muslim people, would ne never develop fibromyalgia, would never develop arthritis, whereas in fact this condition exists right around the world. It exists in industrialised um, countries and in less industrialised countries. It exists in China and Japan and in Europe and North and South America. So. Uh, as the diet varies hugely around the world, most of the arthritic and autoimmune diseases we see, and fibromyalgia as well, are present in all those societies. So I think uh, major dietary modifications uh, probably aren't to be advised. But occasionally people will say to you, I've stopped eating a certain type of bread and I feel a lot better. And I say, well, that's, that's good. Because at the end of the day, people come to see me because they don't feel well and they want to feel better. Um, and if they go away feeling better, that, that's good. But I don't like to recommend something that I, I feel is going to be harmful for them. Um, people do get a lot of aching and, and, and pain. And sometimes when you examine fibromyalgia patients, even when they're older, you still find that the ligaments are quite lax and elastic. That's not a condition, that's just one of those things that some human beings have. It's like having 
green eyes or red hair or something that have quite elastic ligaments, but it does mean your joints can ache a bit more after, after exercise. And again, if you put on a wee bit of weight, if you get older, if you have other conditions, then that wobbling and aching of the joints becomes worse and can certainly add into the whole fibromyalgia picture. So probably if you have elastic joints and you've had what were called growing pains as a child, you may be slightly more likely to develop fibromyalgia when you're older. But I wouldn't say that growing pains, or what were called growing pains, are an early sign of fibromyalgia. And I mean, occasionally I've seen people saying, you know, my eight or nine year old child has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I really think you need to look for another diagnosis if that's the case, because um, I, I've never been convinced that someone that young could develop what I understand to be fibromyalgia anyhow. There are some conditions in medicine that have a very strong hereditary basis. Uh, if your mother and father have the condition, you will definitely have it. Um, those are called autosomal dominant conditions. There are other conditions which are, are translated, um, uh, for example, through the mother, such as haemophilia, which again there's a very clear uh, hereditary basis for. Fibromyalgia doesn't fall into that category. There's not a specific gene that causes fibromyalgia. However, there's no doubt that I see patients in whom two or three sisters have the condition, uh, or parents and children both have the condition. Some of that might be due to the fact that they live in similar circumstances, that they've had similar life experiences, um, and that they have similar personalities. But I suspect underlying this there are genes which uh, make it more likely that you would develop fibromyalgia. I like to think that I'm sympathetic towards sufferers, and I know many other doctors who are. I think one of the problems is there's no specific blood test for fibromyalgia, or no specific x-ray for fibromyalgia. And sometimes uh, at busy clinics um, or in busy GP surgeries, uh, if you come complaining of symptoms and the doctor does a lot of blood tests and x-rays and doesn't find anything which is flagged up as abnormal, then they sometimes will minimise the symptoms. Um, however, I think increasingly people are recognising this as a very genuine condition. There is no doubt that patients suffer significantly from it. Um, and I think it certainly should be taken seriously uh, by the medical profession.